Welcome and aloha. I'm Mark Schlav, the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Today we are going across the sea to Pennsylvania and New York to talk with three extremely experienced and knowledgeable international lawyers. Dennis Unkovic is a partner with the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania law firm of Meyer, Unkovic and Scott. Neil Beaton is a partner with the New York law firm of Holland and Knight. Rory Radding is a partner with the New York law firm of Mario Capuchin Woods. Among many other professional activities, Dennis has recently written a book about the global supply chain, which is sold out. Neil has done many cross-border transactions, and Rory is an accomplished first chair intellectual property trial lawyer. As we near the end of 2021, I wanted to talk with these three wise men about, among other things, navigating into the new year and what can be done to make 2022 better. Welcome, gentlemen. It's good to see you all. How are you? How are you doing? How's everything with you? Hey, everything to be here, Mark. Thank you very Hi, much for inviting me. Good, good. I want to start with kind of a basic question. Um, in a few words, please, each of you describe your professional life as an international lawyer. We'll, we'll go in, in alphabetical order by first name. So Dennis, please begin. Mark, thanks for having me. Um, I started out my career working as chief counsel of the Senate Minority Leader in Washington, D.C. during something called Watergate. You've never heard of it, but it <laughs> happened in the 70s. And I worked for Hugh Scott. After that, I went into private practice of law. For years, I did basically outbound investment of U.S. companies overseas, but now I've seen a lot of it coming back in. So I'm, I'm a corporate lawyer. Okay, Neil? Yeah, I would also describe, describe myself as, as a corporate lawyer. I've, uh, my, my career has been much more involved with doing, um, in, doing inbound work, representing non-U.S. clients, do, doing deals here or, or worldwide um, types of deals. I've never thought of myself as an international lawyer. I'm a, I'm a deal lawyer, a corporate counselor whose practice mainly involves representing non-U.S. clients. And the, and the distinction there is, is more cultural than, than legal. Certainly there is a veneer of additional legal issues that's in, involved when, when you have a non-U.S. Um, party to a deal. But, but the big difference is cultural, coming from a different knowledge base, coming from um, di different expectations and knowing how, how to, uh, how to ro roll with that. Okay, Rory? Yes, well, uh, I was a, a chemist um, for several years, uh, both a environmental chemist in, its, in the 70s when that was in vogue like it is now, and also a, a pharmaceutical chemist. And so I became a patent attorney. And uh, I have to tell you, it is, it's been uh, one of the best choices I think I've made, the only choice I've made, I guess, and it become and broaden that out into everything, uh, all technologies and everything else. And it was interesting to grow up in the era of uh, software when that was developing and also the era of biotech. So I've kind of lived through what's been going on now and the fruits of that we're seeing now. But in terms of uh, an international lawyer, I, I guess I would say I'm not a corporate lawyer, but I represent corporate interests from the intellectual property and technology standpoint. Um, and, and, you know, my professional life has been actually exhilarating as an international IP lawyer. Um, I've learned and worked with different cultures, as has been mentioned, uh, and I've found that it, it, the most interesting thing is most people are about the same <laughs> around the world. Everyone's pretty much the same. They'll put their pants on the same way. Everyone's pretty much the same. But the, 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 the thing that I really find uh, rewarding as an international lawyer is that I deal with very, very creative people from the CEO, chairman of the board, to the, to the scientist. And so a fascinating uh, and to do it internationally adds another dimension that is just, uh, just you know, delightful. You know, all of your answers are show your individualism, and, and it's really interesting. Uh, 
to hear how you each see your practice and international law. Uh, I, I want to go on to kind of a, some general questions, and I'll, then in, in a minute or two, we'll talk about some specific things about your 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 own practices. But first, you know, what does 2022 look like for international lawyers and the international law practice? Where where are we going after a couple years of this COVID pandemic? And I'd like to to get your thoughts based on your experience. And, and so please, uh, let's go, go through that question also. Dennis, wh what, are your, what are your feelings about the outlook for 2022 for international law and international law practice? Uh, Mark, let me pick on something that Neil said just a minute ago. A lot of mine is in and outbound foreign investment. What I've seen happening starting as, as, as recently as 10 years ago is it's becoming increasingly difficult to invest in another country. We have CFIUS here, the Committee for Foreign Investment in the United States, but now the Chinese have something very similar. The British have something coming in in January of 2022 and really around the world. So what I see is the open trade uh, regimen that we've had going on over the last 40 to 50 years under the WTO and on, I think is changing significantly. And so I think the ability for companies to go wherever they want and buy whatever investments they would like, and I do work for two very large Japanese companies, Neil, is going to become more difficult. That's number one. The second thing is I think the global supply chain is going to continue to get worse. It's transforming itself, and that's going to affect companies all over the globe. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, my, my, my experience is, is very similar. We, we had a deal that was... Um, that cratered because of CFIUS about three years ago, and was a true international transaction. It was a Chinese company buying an Italian company from a Japanese company, sure. but about a third of the Italian company's operations were in the U.S. and and they therefore needed CFIUS approval. And um, years earlier, um, it would have been a would have been a rubber stamp. But it got ca ca caught up in in in, in the politics. Hmm. Rory, yeah, I mean I've done deals as well uh, in the past, but uh, but in looking in looking forward uh, 2022, um, I think um, particularly in the the litigation area is going to be very very uh, international litigation slash arbitration area be very very big, particularly with the breakdown of globalization. Um, and the supply chain, you're going to, there are going to be a lot more disputes going on, international disputes, not only between governments, but between uh, parties, you know, the, the deals that Neil and Dennis have been talking about. And, all, and also, I, I think that even uh, the regimen that's been predominant, you know, from TRIPS, uh, basically to try to get a more uniform worldwide IP order, I think is going to start falling apart a little bit in terms of actually acquiring intellectual property around the world. It's gonna be much more difficult. I think you're gonna see more barriers sent up. Um, and then I, as I mentioned, litigation around the world, even in China. I mean, China, recently there was a, a case where they're trying to use Chinese law to stop a deal going on in the United States, um, but it was you know, in China, not in the US. So it was, it, it's been a very interesting ride and I think Particularly if we do have a recession, which God forbid, I hope we don't. Um, yeah, I think you'll see litigation go through the roof. Whoa, well, uh, all of you have distinct views too about different aspects. And I wanna dive into that a little bit more, uh, a little uh, more detail from each of you uh, on kind of the, the issues that you raised. Now, now Dennis, but, I mean, what is behind this worldwide trend to make foreign direct investment more difficult? I mean, from the U.S. to China to the EU, what, why and where is it going? I'll be very critical of the United States for a moment. I think for 30 years we were had our companies were run by accounting accountants or or, or financial people, and they said, "What's the EBITDA? What's you know, what's my best EBITDA? I, I want to get this," and so. If you eliminate inventory, and if you eliminate you know, certain things, you can save a lot of money. So a lot of America's capability in manufacturing has essentially disappeared. Today, 18% of the microprocessors that the US consumes are made in the United States. 
the other 78% or more is made outside the United States. And so I think governments have finally figured out there are national security interests. And I'm not talking about here about protecting the steel industry, but there are things in which governments have to be more sensitive. And as a result, if Toshiba wants to come in and, and to buy the largest, I, let's go back to uh, 1988. A Fairchild Semiconductor was the largest U.S. manufacturer of chips back then. The Japanese wanted to come in and buy it. And as a result, that was blocked, which led to Exxon Florio and other laws that we have now. But I see that increasing around the world. The British, I think, were shocked by COVID, seeing that, well, do we have any gloves? Do we have any respirators? You, you can go through the list. And so this is a reaction for political people in the country saying, what do I really need to make or partially make in my country to protect myself? The, the result is I'm going to make it more difficult for somebody from Japan to buy in the U.S. The Chinese, well, we can talk about the Chinese later if you want, but have really gone much further than that. I'll stop. What about you, Rory? Well, if I, if I may, I, you, you hit a point I, 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 that I'm interested in, actually, um, with, uh, you know, the... the the break, what I'll call the breakdown of globalization. I mean, we, that, the, the, the naivete perhaps, or maybe the, the hope was way back when, a few years, 30 years ago, whatever, was that, you know, we'd have one, one wonderful world. Everyone would be copacetic with everyone else. And uh, we would suddenly, you know, be able to have, uh, you know, uh, manufacturing in an area where it's lower cost and sales in an area where it's higher cost. So you were able to had this globalization, a little bit like mercantilism during the, you know, before, during the early days of, the, of uh, pre pre U.S. you know, in the old uh, the old uh, British colonial system, um, and and it, it it's proven that we're back to nationalism again uh, worldwide, and it's it's causing problems, which is why I say the the IP regime that I mentioned was an, an attempt to make things easier in terms of. Uh, invention, innovation, it's things of that sort. And I think that's going to start breaking down again. And you're going to have, you're going to go back, you know, 100 years, 200 years, whatever it might be. And even 100 years with, um, with the way the, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, 100 years ago, you know, we were, uh, in terms of the IP systems, we used uh, what was called, um, uh, it was called, well, it was basically nationalistic, um, and and then uh, there was a, a move for uni universality, uh, which uh, was a, an attempt to, uh, if you 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 could you know uh, uh, protect your intellectual property worldwide, uh, and so I think we're kind of mixed up right now. We're going back to the, we're going back to 100 years. Everything's starting over all over again. Yeah. Yeah. What, what is and the cross-border? If, yeah, if I could just follow, follow up on, on that, I think it's remarkable. There are such sharp political differences in the U.S. on almost every issue except this one. There hasn't been a single candidate in the last um, couple presidential election cycles who has espoused free trade. Every everyone is is. Um, is campaigning on protectionism. So, even, so even, and, and and if, I could, if I could break in the, one of the points about 100 years ago, I'm worried about the tariff situation because that's what really created, you know, the war, world wars, is basically, you know, the, the, the tariffs and, and, and means, at least I believe it is, maybe Dennis is different, you or Neil, but I, I think that that is very dangerous um, because once you put up the, the boundaries between countries, uh, it's very easy for uh, one country to want more and then to start uh, warring with the other side. Right. And, and, and did you hear the tariffs discussed in the, in the presidential campaign last year? Yeah. No, it wasn't an issue. Yeah, that's in a way that's frightening, isn't it? Um, yep. And as different as Trump and Biden are. I predicted four years from now that the Biden administration on trade will be very similar to what we ended up with under Trump. Now, whether that's good or bad, we can debate, well, but, but they really are on a plane, if you agree, yeah. Neil. I, I totally agree. I do too. And you know, not, neither Biden nor Trump would, would, would agree with that, but, but they are in the same. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes. Well, well, I, I want to move on a little bit, Rory. You know, you know, you mentioned the uh, it, the intellectual property litigation. I mean, uh, are there going to? I mean, are there going to be trials, or are there going to be? I mean, how's that going to look in the future? What, what's that going to well, look like? Well, let, 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 let's take um, what's going on. What has been going on during COVID? Uh, most uh, trials have been, I'd say most, if not all, have been Zoomed. A lot of Zooming, a lot of Microsoft Teams, a lot of WebExing, all of that has been going on. Uh, and I think uh, that you will have trials. And I think uh, uh, arbitrations currently are, are done by Zoom as well. And I think what's going to happen is we're going to have a hybrid in my mind where uh, as the courts can open up, which they are now, but uh, hopefully they can stay open, you're probably going to be able to go into court as a lawyer and go before a judge or a jury, but the witnesses will be zoomed in. Okay. And that way, and that th I, because during the COVID, uh, an in-house count, one of my clients, an in-house counsel, was explaining how he actually enjoyed zooming because he didn't have to zoom around in an airplane to all the various litigations that he had to uh, go to. And he could just tap in for 15 minutes here and there, listen there, see how the lawyers are doing. And so he could do, he had like, as a litigation counsel, he had 200 or 250 litigations simultaneously. And he could go into depositions. He could do anything he needed just by sitting in his office. And if there was a need to be in, in court for a very important matter, he could fly there. Okay, I think that's so what we're going to see. Okay, I institutionalizing the hybrid. Yes. I think so. I think that's the way it will go. Yeah. Okay. Well, kind of, I want to move on a little bit from that. And uh, but you, you brought up travel, and I mean, all of us. I mean, we we travel to we we saw each other all over the world in yes. the past, and now that's changed. Uh, Dennis, I know you you normally would travel a lot. But I'd like to ask you all, where, where do we look like for travel? What does that look like in the next year? And uh, I mean, even if it opens up, do you want to travel? So let's start with Dennis. Where are we with international travel? For three years, I was the chairman of Meritas, which is a legal network, and I was traveling about 150 a year. This was right before COVID. Um, I do not think that international travel is going to come back the way it was. I think a lot of companies are going to save money. I'm not talking about lawyers necessarily, but they're going to have more meetings by teams. But I find it very difficult to negotiate, maybe because I'm a bad negotiator, but you know, doing it over this kind of thing. I really prefer to be face to face with someone in the same room, even if we're sitting 12 feet across when I'm trying to do a transaction. I think that basic isn't going to change a lot. Those people will have to travel. But the volume of people that be skirting all over the world and going to trade association meetings and that, I, I see it certainly not picking up very much in 2022. After 2022, I'm, I'm not that smart. What do you think, uh, Neil? Neil? Yeah, yeah. Or sorry. Yeah, I, well, well to, to start with, I think we've all done remarkably well um, with, 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 with that, without face-to-face -face meetings. I've been busy the, the, the last two years. My, my, my firm has had two of its best years ever, and I think most firms have. Um, the, the legal profession is doing well. Co costs are down. Um, um, <laughs> hours are, 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 are still the same or, or as hot, 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 higher than ever. Um, and, but particularly in doing in, international work, there, there, there is a lot of relationships in, in, in involved. Um, and although I mainly do inbound work, I, I direct a lot of work outbound. How do I di direct that work? It's people I've met over the years. Now, I don't need so much to, to, to and my, at this point in my career, to meet new people. I already know a, a lot of people in a lot of jurisdictions. But and 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 so um, short term or even medium term, we we can um, co coast along on, on the basis of ha having met people people already. Um, I just don't know how young lawyers are going to develop the same relationships. And um, 
you know, when the four of us are all are all retired, um, what is the next generation go, go, going to? Um, you know, will my successor know someone in, in Hawaii, in Tokyo, in Paris, or, or wherever? Um, it's it's tough, and so um, you know, I think some you know some amount of of, of travel and and, and get, getting to know people. Um, is still still going to be needed. Rora. Yeah, I, I, I agree with uh, Dennis and Neil. I, I think that uh, nothing beats face-to-face -face meetings and getting to know somebody and uh, in some occasions becoming friends with them and meeting their family and everything that you know goes along with, uh, particularly internationally to, to learn the different cultures and, and mores. And, and it, it's very helpful in your, in your dealings. I represented major Japanese companies for many, many, many years and got along very well with, with uh, the Japanese, as well as I've represented Chinese companies and European. But I mean, it, it, it's a cultural gestalt, you know, and in those years particularly. And so I just find that that is, it is, is very, very important uh, for an international lawyer, particularly if you're going to put the name international in front of your name lawyer, you better have some international experience, I think. But um, I agree. I, I think there are some things you can do um, on Zoom or Teams or whatever it might be. Uh, you don't need to get on a plane for a 10 minute meeting uh, unless there's other stuff you want to accomplish in terms of meeting you know, various. If you're going to visit you know, the chairman of the board of a major corporation, maybe you want to meet him and plus every or her and everybody else in the team uh, so that you can develop some rapport with them. But other than that, you know, for, for everyday uh, negotiations, I think, and meetings, uh, you can certainly do it. Uh, you've done it for years uh, on the phone. Uh, there's no difference. Now we're seeing people and we can get a little better body language feel than, um, than over the phone, clearly. Um, You're right. I think, I think we need a bit more. Mark, can I tell you one quick funny story? Yeah, yeah. My wife and I were married for 32 years a couple of years ago, and somebody came up to my wife and said, You're, you, What's, what's your secret? You've been married 32 years. And my wife looked at him and said, my husband's an international lawyer. He's only been home six months. <laughs> and I don't know what your relationships are, but my wife misses my travel. <laughs> I have to say, so does mine, but I started taking her in the uh, last few years with me and she misses that more than misses me. <laughs> yeah. Well, what, what... You, you, all of you talk about relationships and and then, you know, Neil mentioned young lawyers too. Um, yeah. And I mean, we're, I, I totally agree. I mean, relationships are so important. I couldn't be talking with the three of you unless we had a relationship from international travel and meetings. Yep. It's just, it's, it, you know, I hope that, I really think it's, it's a strength to be able to do it. But, you know, Larry Foster, the Dean of the Law, former Dean of the Hawaii Law School, you know, I was wondering if, if, if Zoom is the new normal, and you've all kind of mentioned that a little bit. I mean, is, is Zoom the new normal? I guess, it, I'll let, let me ask you, De, Dennis. Well, can, can I go first? Because I, yeah. I, I, I have a side, side it. So in terms of younger people as well, uh, I'm, I'm on the board of a uh, law school. And um, because of COVID, they've had to do this remote learning. And they actually opened the school this past year and they did both. The experience with, with Zoom and Teams is is a hundred times better than a, a conference um, phone call. Yes, and, uh, I feel right. And you know, and another thing is, you know, if, if, if Mark Zuckerberg has his way, we'll end up doing metaverse, uh, <laughs> and and we'll be able to touch and feel each other in kind of the metaverse way, I guess. Uh, but I, I, I personally, again, I, I prefer face to face, but I do think that we've come a long way. And I think um, internationally, uh, there will also be a lot of use of artificial intelligence uh, in in these uh, meetings. Um, and I think that in terms of meeting people, uh, I think we, we, we may lose a little bit of the human element in some respects, because the artificial intelligence may decide, uh, you know, use, use of it may decide who you should meet, when you should meet them, and how you should meet them. And, and your, your clients are, are, are 
okay with the, the way that things are working? And have they made any suggestions about how better to, to proceed or that maybe we could, that you could share? Uh, in terms of uh, meetings or in terms of just 2022? What, 2022? Okay, well, uh, yes. Um, uh, you know, uh, it depends. I, I guess it depends on the current state of the, of the economies in the world uh, as to how they view it. If we, if right now we're in a very confused or contradictory period, I think. And uh, so there's a lot of uncertainty in general. But I think most companies or most of the clients I deal with, um, you know, are just going about their business and um, are looking forward to a upbeat 2022, but are also mindful to be cautious. I guess cautious and optimistic would be a good way to say. Okay. Uh, right, right, and probably more optimistic um, two weeks ago than they are now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, uh, so basically everybody, I mean, it's everybody's moving forward and I want to, it sounds like the clients are, hey, let, let's keep, keep marching. Let's keep moving forward. Let's keep going on forward, which I guess is hopeful. And, and so let me, let me ask you directly, each of you, you know, despite what's happened the last two years, is there anything that gives you personally hope or optimism for the new year? Dennis, let's. I think the U.S. and China relationship is going to get worse. I do not have optimism there, and I think that's going to have a rollover effect throughout the world uh, on many levels. And so our business is good. I'm, I'm like Neil. I thought we were going to go out of business, and we had two good years, which is fine as lawyers. But I, I do think the international trade balance is imbalanced, and I really don't see it getting much better in 2022. Sorry to be Debbie Downer. Okay. Well, well I, will, I will add an optimistic note, even though it's not as optimistic as, as it was a month or, month or two ago. But the opening um, of the U.S. to, um, to, to travel for, for, uh, for, from, from Europe was a big, big step. I, um, I, I have European clients that just stopped um, considering deals, deals in the U.S., because they couldn't come here and, and meet the people on the other side. They couldn't transfer the, the, their, mm -hmm. their people to work here. Everyone was, um, uh, or a lot of people breathed a huge size of um, re relief when, when, when the um, tra travel prohibition from the 30 something countries um, was lifted in November. Um, we now have a restriction on s s Southern Africa, um, but the, the, um, at least in ter terms of my, my clientele, that, that's not, not particularly relevant. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think the travel restrictions are, are going to be, or travel restrictions or lack thereof, Will be a major, major factor in in, in, in whether um, um, in international deal making um, um, springs back springs back to normal. Okay, R Rory. Yeah. I'm, look I'm looking for some hope here. Yeah, well, I'm going to give you hope. But first, I want to say, you know, the the, the downer that we're talking about here is that we're actually back to the future. You know, we're we're kind of back in the 1950s to 70s period internationally. It's a, it's you know with all the you know, the, um, the, the tariffs and everything else that's been going on, the Chinese. And, uh, I mean, we're, we're kind of backwards a little bit there, but my optimism is in medical science. Mm -hmm. I, have to, I have to say that, uh, and as a former pharmaceutical chemist, and also having done many biotech deals, we've been in many, many biotech pharma companies, uh, I think medical science had, is proving itself to be premium and, and, and it's providing a lot of optimism that we'll get through this COVID thing, we'll, we'll get on top of it. And the most remarkable thing are these vaccines, uh, this company Moderna, you know, they couldn't even get past uh, step one and they've been trying to do this for years and years and years and years and years. Yeah. And they were chosen to be the ones because they could do it faster. They and, uh, and Pfizer, right. they could get it done fast and it works. 
So, you know, and so I think it, it's really proven out kind of the, um, the, the concept. It's like proof of concept for not just the technology, but, but for medical science, that when it needs to, to come to the fore, it, it's there. So there's a lot of stuff going on. And for me, that's optimistic because I think we can clear up a lot of things. And if we can just get a little more internationality out of it, it'd be better. Mark, okay. I'm, I'm the, the negative guy. Let me say one thing. The good <laughs> thing about what's happening is more reshoring is going to happen in the United States. There is going to be, I think the US economy will benefit, but it's not going to be so much dependent on other countries. But I think there's going to be, whether you have Biden in again or someone else, that will be the good news, but that's going to be the next three or four years. Thank you. I think, I think you're right, Dennis. Okay, in the, in the, we have a few minutes left. I'd like to give you each just a, a, a minute to close and tell us the most important aspect of your law practice as we move forward. Maybe, maybe some advice you'd give young lawyers. Uh, as we move into the new year, how do we navigate the new year? Gentlemen, Dennis, let's, let's start with you. What, what are your thoughts? I think that younger lawyers have a challenge of being able to make contacts with older lawyers. So my advice to them would be try to find someone. When I was growing up, they had mentors. You know, you did a mentorship. I think if you can find someone who will listen to you and educate you, whether they're in your own firm or a, or a well-known lawyer like the other two people on the panel, that's the way to make yourself a better lawyer and to improve yourself going forward. Neil? Yeah, um, I, I think Dennis hit, hit, the, hit the nail on the head there. Um, if, uh, if I were to give advice to, 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 you, to young lawyers, it would be get yourself into the office. Stop, stop working from home. Just because you can work, from, work remotely doesn't mean you should work remotely. It, working remotely is fine in the short run. Uh, uh, particularly for for a young lawyer, uh, I, I, I don't I don't know how you um, progress to the next step unless you are in, interacting with your uh, with your colleagues. I, I, yeah, just a couple of points. So one, I, I agree. You know, uh, I'm dressed down here, right? This is a dress down. I remember the days when you didn't dress down, right? But then you were given the choice, and I always dressed up because there was a choice. I could dress down or I could dress up. It didn't really matter when you entered. Right, 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 right. When you're an associate, you want to look like a partner. It, right, exactly. But, but so, so similarly, I think, is with these associates today, yes, they can work from home. But it's the same thing. You have a choice. You're given a choice. So you have the opportunity to sometimes come to work or all the time or to work from home. But there is that choice, and I think that's that's a very good thing to, to um, for a younger lawyer to understand that there's choice, and they should accept the choice, and they should you know they should do both really. One other point I really wanted to make was for for younger uh, younger lawyers. Uh, it, it, you know, I, I learned as a young lawyer, and we had I was at a, 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 one of the best IP firms, and when I was growing up, and ultimately ran it. Uh, the the one thing I wanted to mention was we, we were taught it wasn't about being the greatest litigator. It wasn't about being the greatest lawyer. It was about solving problems and achieving the business goals that your clients had. And I think that's a message that I'd really like to make sure younger lawyers understand. They need to have the tools, but their clients are business people if they're doing business. And it's their problems, not yours. <laughs> You've got to solve their problems so they can achieve their business goals. Well, gentlemen, I truly appreciate you being together with me today on this conversation. And uh, one thing I take away that I feel very strongly about that's come up time and time again as we talk is relationships, not internationally, <laughs> uh, you know, in our daily lives, and I think all of you feel that. That's what I'm, I'm taking away from this, is how important relations, that personal relationships are. And as we move into the next year, let, let, let's keep that in mind. And, let's, and I think that's a good message to send out. So gentlemen, thank you for your relationships. It's good to see you. Yeah.
uh, and aloha from Hawaii. Aloha. Thank you, Mark. Dennis.